So in this week's final uh, little lecture piece, we're going to go back and revisit space frames. And we talked about these briefly at the end of our discussion on trusses, right? What happens when you take a linear truss and set it at right angles to itself? What, what happens and what sort of benefits do you get? I want to go into a little bit greater depth uh, today and talk in, in detail a little bit about um, how we actually put these together, how we connect them, what some of the architectural possibilities are uh, for space frames. So if you remember uh, the lectures on vector active systems or trusses, we did these at the end of our discussions on uh, beams and girders, and we talked about how we can use a truss to basically hack section active principles and turn them into something that has, if you sort of zoom out, has a very similar behavior to a beam. But if you kind of zoom in and look at the mechanics of it, the way that the tension, compression, and shear get distributed in a vector active system or a truss is all about the network. And it's not so much about the, the section or the solid nature of the material. So here, an example of a truss that we used, we looked at uh, 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 loads on the truss and the reactions, and then we went in and we looked at each individual node of this truss. Everything we noted was triangulated, right? Very important that we've uh, basically broken the span down, not into a, a giant beam, but into a network of triangular panels. We looked at each one of these nodes. We tried to imagine how we could stabilize each one of them. So thinking about the node in isolation as a free body, looking at the forces that were on it, starting with usually the ones at the end where we have a reaction in one member with a vertical component, and then sort of working our way across, trying to tell a story about how each of these individual nodes might be stabilized. And what we found is that there's a very kind of uh, predictable pattern to how these loads get distributed throughout these members. All of the loads are going to be axial, right? Nothing in a truss uh, is going to go into bending. The deck will between the nodes, but if we zoom out and just think about the truss itself, remember that all of the cords will be either in tension or in compression, right? Nothing is going to be in bending. And when we calculate it, what we find is that there's a, a, a very kind of predictable and kind of beautiful pattern to how all of this gets resolved. The top elements in the simply supported truss will all be in compression, just like a beam where the top flange is in compression and the bottom element will always be in tension, right? Just like the bottom flange of a simply supported beam is, is always in tension. Uh, this means, again, that it's essentially a, a, a structure in bending, like we would expect. Um, but what's interesting, of course, is that the cords in between alternate compression, tension, compression, compression, tension, compression. And these are basically taking the, the function of the web of a beam, which is there to resist shear, essentially, between the, the two flanges. Um, and it, it, it turns that function into a kind of networked or geometric solution. Instead of relying on the, the, the thickness or the solidity of the web, now we have the triangulated geometry that's basically fixing our compression flange, if you like, uh, and our tension flange. So very effective principle. It's a way of designing a, a kind of beam in a super efficient way. We're usually giving up a, a fair amount of depth, but we're removing an awful lot of dead weight, right? We don't have a web. We don't have those thick, heavy flanges that we do in a beam. Instead, we have this network of triangulated panels that resolves all of the loads into axial components. And therefore, we remove a lot of dead weight, which means trusses can span a lot farther, right? So trusses are already a long span system, right? The vector active systems are already kind of by their nature long span. And we looked at some examples of these. The kind of classic example is the Pompidou Center in Paris, where these trusses just kind of march down a line, right? There are, there's one structural bay, and that is almost extruded or repeated uh, down the length of the, of, the, of the building. And you can see here, here's the compression flange, nice and thick, like we'd expect a compression element to be. Here is the tension flange cord in the language of trusses. And then you can see that the cords that form the triangular network uh, are also resolved into compression flanges or compression cords, sorry, the thick ones, and tension cords, the skinny ones. So you can see that already here, we can fine tune the cords to what we know they're going to be, right? Intention or compression. Truss 
already super uh, effective. So what happens then when we take a truss and set it at right angles to itself? Well, you may remember that when we were talking about slabs, we talked about one-way versus two-way action and how in one-way action, we're literally looking at the ability of the material to resist load, to resist deflection on, along one axis. When we set beams parallel or perpendicular to one another, right, like in a waffle slab, if you do a sort of thought experiment, what does it take to deflect a waffle slab? Well, you have to push down one set of joists, right? You have to deflect one set of joists. But if you think about it, that slab, as you deflect it, it's going to pull down not only the joist you're thinking of, but it's going to pull down the joist that goes in the opposite direction as well. And we're going to be able to rely on the combined resistance of those two joists, the fact that they have to move together because they're connected, to limit deflection and therefore to spread the load in multiple directions. And if we size the waffle slab right, if it has a roughly square proportion, what we find is we get much, much greater performance. We can use a smaller depth, we can use less material. We find that the waffle slab is stronger than a one-way slab and it also resists deflection better. So what if we take that principle with a much more efficient system, a vector active structural system, uh, and do the same thing, right? Turn trusses at right angles to themselves. Or even better, what if we make a network where trusses run in multiple directions, where we find that when we try to push down on one node of a space frame, right, a multiple direction truss, that it has to pull down with it three or four or more directions of truss to actually deflect. We find the same kind of synergy that we get in a waffle slab. Just now it's in a two directional or two way truss, what we call a space frame. And these have been around for uh, a century or so. As soon as people understood the, that you could hack together a vector active system with a two-way system and achieve these kind of tremendous efficiencies, they start showing up in factories especially. Um, but by the middle of the last century, we see them in things like airplane terminals. This is one by a proposal by IM Pei on the left, uh, in steel on the top, which we're kind of used to seeing, and in concrete on the bottom, which doesn't work so well, right? You'd like to be able to turn all of these elements into linear elements instead of planar. And on the right, maybe a more famous one, this is Mies van der Rohe's proposal ever built uh, for a convention center in Chicago. So that convention center is interesting because it's one of the cleanest uh, examples of a space frame that we've got in the mid-century. And it also shows the real benefits to it. So this is a, was a proposal for about a 200 foot span and you can see that there's maybe a, a 20 foot deep, or sorry, a 15 feet deep uh, space frame on the top, has trusses running in two directions. And you can see here, lattice trusses and purlins, they're actually cross braced in both directions. So they work as a space frame. And you can see it's a very, very simple truss that's then basically just set at right angles to itself. And any deflection that occurs in any part of the roof is going to not just have to deflect one truss, it's going to have to deflect two trusses, right? Because they're running in, in opposite directions. Um, the span is uh, such that you have about a one to 20 span to depth ratio, very, very efficient. And if you look, you can see that Kornacker, the engineer, takes advantage of the incredible light weight of a space frame uh, to make this very, very thin, essentially bearing wall around the edge out of vector active components. So these are raked columns that take the gravity load of the roof, but also provide the lateral resistance for the, for the structure. You can see that he resolves them down onto these sort of stubby piers at the base and makes this real kind of effort to show you just how lightweight all of the steel framing is uh, above all of, the, all of the ground structures. So basically think of a space frame as hacking together a vector active truss with a two-way slab and getting the benefits of both of those. As it happens, the convention center that Chicago eventually built uh, in 1970 is also a great example of a space frame done by a former Mies employee uh, named Gene Summers. McCormick Place was one of the biggest spans, one of the largest volume uh, spaces uh, ever built in 1971. And it sort of wears its structural principle on its sleeve. When you're in the building or when you're outside driving up to it, you see this kind of network of steel W shapes, fairly crudely put together, uh, 
um, resting on these uh, compression elements, right? Resting on these columns. And if you kind of look long enough, you can see exactly where the loads are going. The compression element here comes up to a node. These bits here are in tension. They're kind of like the, the cables or the tension elements in a cable stayed structure, right? Holding the, the, the frame up a little bit. And you can see that those are supplemented by compression elements here. These are then gonna be tension elements and you can start to follow it through as a truss, realizing that it has a cantilevered bit out here, uh, more simply supported bit back here. It's going to be basically one of those uh, double cantilevered beams, except that it's all vector active and it runs in two directions. So all of these kind of factors working together to make it more efficient. The cantilever balancing the simple support, the depth of the space frame being resolved by a vector active system, much, much lighter than a solid web, and then getting that two-way behavior where uh, any load that's trying to deflect the roof is going to have to deflect more than one of the planes in the system, right? So more and more efficiencies. And if you look closer, you can see that all of the elements of this are W shapes, right? They're all I-beams, so they can take a little localized bending uh, in addition to the compression or tension that, that they're being asked to. So the geometry of a space frame, just like the geometry of a truss, relies on it always being triangulated. And we're mostly interested in triangulating it in section, uh, but as you can imagine, that can get uh, a, a little bit mathematically more efficient to also triangulate it in plan, right? easier to resist uh, horizontal loads, lateral loads, or racking if we've triangulated it in plan. But so long as we have that triangulation in section, most of the job of a space frame uh, gets done. And you can see here, for example, uh, a bay of uh, a, an equilateral pyramid space frame where you can imagine that that support is always going to be permanently uh, fixed with regard to all of the other nodes, both in its bay and then everywhere else. When you repeat that over and over and over again, what you find is that you get not just this two-way action, but you actually get three axes that the, the space frame is working in. And the more axes it works in, of course, if you like, the more elements or the more trusses have to deflect when any node uh, wants to move, right, or wants to get pushed out of the way. And therefore, more and more efficiencies, the more axes that we have. Half octahedron will work on a square bay plan. A tetrahedron works on a triangular plan, right? More efficient, often more difficult to plan program into that, right? We like squares uh, in plan, triangles uh, in section. And you can see that there are families of space frames that just go on and on and on and on. McCormick Place is a square on square, right? So is the, the original Mies Convention Hall. But with more uh, complexity, we get more efficiency. So offsetting the squares or squares on diagonals or triangles on triangles or triangles on hexagons. The more we resolve a space frame into triangular or pyramidal elements, uh, the more fix fixity that we get, the more rigidity that we get uh, out, of the, out of the frame. How we resolve these is often both a kind of engineering question and an architectural question. So you've already seen a couple of examples, right? The, the original Mies Convention Center, the columns or the, um, the, the vector active uh, elements, the triangular elements on the edge that hold it up, come into the points on the bottom of the space frame, right? They're very, very simply resolved. But we can also have kind of intermediate units, uh, in, inverted pyramids, where we take a few nodes and bring them down onto a, a, a single column point. Or we can have what are called crosshead beams. This is what McCormick Place does. A column comes up, in McCormick Place, the column actually goes all the way through, but then it also has beams that support the nodes immediately adjacent to it. And you can imagine that this, for instance, puts a great deal of shear stress in a beam, but it puts a great deal of compression stress into those two elements there, right? Those two elements are now carrying the weight of that entire bay of the space frame. Whereas here, uh, these two elements can be fairly normal. We're putting all of the stress directly into the column. Here, we're putting all of the stress into a beam, right? Dividing up the, what is analogous to the shear force uh, in a support at a, at a beam. And here you see what a plan, for instance, of the crosshead beam would look like. Depending on which one of these we pick, 
that column is either on the node or it is in between nodes. And that can have a real architectural effect, right? We may have some interest in how we resolve the spanning structure and the bearing structure. And it may be a discussion as much about uh, aesthetics or about function as it is about structural behavior. When we uh, design these, we're designing them based on a span to depth, just like a section active structural element like a beam, where we're usually looking at between like 14 and 16 as a span to depth ratio, right? We can go 16 times the depth uh, in terms of span. And you can see with the space frame, we get this additional efficiency. We're not just designing uh, a, a single directional element. We're designing them in two directions. And where that shows up is in the span to depth ratio. We can get up to 20 or 25 as a span to depth ratio, depending on the loading. And that comes about A, because of this two-way action, but also because we're removing a lot of the dead weight of a typical slab or a typical set of beams, uh, replacing it with air. So we're removing the dead weight of the structure itself. And you'll remember from our calculations with beams that the dead weight of the structure, especially when we get to bigger and bigger spans, starts to add up. And at some point, we find that that's the controlling factor. So removing all of that dead weight from what would otherwise be a, maybe a heavy roof slab gives us that additional span, or it could give us additional loading, right? And here you see just a, a, a real quick calculation for a, a 64 foot span, an average span to depth ratio of 20, gives us a, a, a depth of three and a half feet, right? So very, very small or kind of small compared with what we would get with a, with a simple one-way beam. When we get into the uh, actual detailing of it, the space frame is reliant on uh, reliable connections, right? Rigid connections that allow for the smooth transfer of forces from one element uh, to another. If the system is uh, well detailed, well connected, um, we will get a very, very rigid space frame. What we don't want is elements to be able to move around a little bit. So we find a whole kind of family, both of connections you might make uh, in the field, bolted, right, where we have some maybe factory-made elements that fix the geometry of the connections, uh, or uh, welded plates. We may show up with uh, gusset plates that are welded together in the shop, and we may weld the, the elements to them uh, in the field. But we also have a lot of proprietary systems where we can actually go out and buy, basically, uh, a ready-made uh, uh, space frame system that will come with uh, connections. In this case, the screwing connections look like little soccer balls, or we'll have cast or uh, welded connection pieces that show up on site and that can accommodate uh, either I-beams or in this case, Unistrut, or with the, the screw-in uh, types, again, proprietary connections. Um, we fix the lengths, we order the right connections with the right angles. I'm assuming we've done the math right, the geometry right, we literally just kind of put it together, you know, almost like an Ikea flat pack on site. Hopefully uh, all the dimensions work and we end up with a space frame that, that matches the, the profile and things that we want. All of these though, note, are about fixing the cords of the space frame to one another in a, in a fixed triangular geometry. Um, that can get complicated. And one of the downsides of space frames has always been the kind of, not just organizational, right, doing the math to figure out the actual geometry, um, but getting the, these elements, gusset plates or unistruct connectors or screwing connectors, getting them to exactly the right geometry so that when everything goes together on site, uh, everything kind of fits, right? We don't, we're not stuck with an element that seems like it's too short or too long. That's gotten much, much easier, of course, uh, with building information modeling, and it's gotten much easier with computer-aided manufacture. Right? When we can digitally fabricate these, we get not only reliable, precise shapes, uh, dimensions, but we can also keep track of all of the numbers, all of the complicated geometry uh, that comes up with it much, much easier. We can do more complicated shapes and space frames today than we could even sort of 10 or 15 years ago. The geometry uh, of the connections, of course, relies or depends on whatever the geometry that we're using in plan and section is. And particularly these proprietary systems, we may be locked into 30, 60, 90 or 45, 45, 90. 
We may be locked into square on square or square on hexagon, uh, those sorts of geometries, right? We may not be able to get quite the flexibility uh, that we might like. If we're going to kind of go uh, off chart and design particularly a very complex space frame, it may be on us and the engineers, contractors and fabricators to develop systems that can handle ever-changing geometry, right? Not just figuring out what thousands of different connections look like, but keeping track of which ones go where. There is still gonna be some uh, uh, impulse to regularize things, right? To ease the process, not only of fabrication, but of organization, keeping track of all of this complexity. So a couple of examples just to show the, the kind of range of space frames. We looked at this one uh, when we looked at vector active systems. Here, the architectural solution to the kind of bird's nest of space frame elements is simply to hide it. And you can see that the column in this case is coming up through the center of the bay. And so there's a, a column head, basically, if you like, that has compression struts that go to essentially the node on the top member. These are all welded together and in detailing, note that they've given themselves space to allow a welder to get up there and actually affix the, the pieces to one another. There's an architectural ceiling that hides all of that. And even though we might think, oh, well, you know, you want to express the actual structure, you want to see the thing, um, what that allows is for uh, kind of rougher welds that don't need to be ground. That saves time and money on the site, lets the welder do their job without worrying about the aesthetics of it. Um, the result is a little bit like the Pan Am terminal that we saw in the, in the last lecture, uh, where you're kind of slightly mystified, right? The roof seems to be uh, floating in a way that, in this case, the architect, uh, Gertrude Kerbis, wanted you to think, right? Wanted you to, to sense that the roof was floating or hovering or Air Force Academy, you know, maybe flying just a little bit. Really, the, the kind of most, to me, the most impressive um, proposal for a space frame there were these sets of hangers that we looked at by Conrad Voxman. And we can look at this now and see that this is an incredibly effective, incredibly efficient four-way space frame, right? Uh, in and out, left to right, and then diagonals on uh, going both directions. So the, that four kind of axis space frame means that there are basically four vector active uh, elements resisting the deflection of every node. And so we're spreading the load out, we're spreading the resistance out really through this network of vector active elements. Um, the genius of Voxman though, was that he figured out how to do this with flexible connectors. So these connectors, you would just make thousands of them and they could actually rotate, clamp around pipes in ways that allowed for adjustment on the site. So that literally in a, uh, space frame this complicated, um, there are only a couple of details and everything else is basically, today we would use a spreadsheet with thousands and thousands of cords that would have predefined lengths. And Voxman uh, did this in a way that these could be assembled very rapidly. The program was for a hangar that could shelter all of the Air Force's planes in the event of a nuclear war. So it has to get built in a hurry. And what Voxman does is he comes up with a way to basically put one of these on a bunch of trucks, send it out to the site. The nodes all slide over some pipes and have welded connections to other ones. And in a matter of a couple of days, he, he says you could assemble the thousands and thousands of cords and nodes uh, into a structure that could basically be self-lifting, right? self-erecting uh, uh, and provide you a shelter within a very short period of time. Um, never built, but uh, one of the, the most kind of optimistic uh, uh, perspectives for what a space frame might be able to do, in particular in terms of uh, saving time on the, on the job site. And today, of course, we are much less worried about uh, regularity and precision. We've kind of outsourced all of that to our digital tools. And so, so long as we have software that can keep track of thousands of different parts, some of which may be you know, a fraction of an inch different. Uh, and so long as we can produce connections that have a range of geometries, either through uh, multi-axial milling or through uh, robot welding, um, we can basically make any shape we want. And there's nothing kind of magic about the flat spanning space frame. Uh, 
we can hack the space frame together with other shapes. So we could, for example, as you see here, design what's basically a surface structure. We'll get to what that is in, in, the, in the next set of lectures. Um, and instead of relying just on a thin shell of concrete, we could make the surface into a network of triangulated nodes and cords, basically a space frame that is also curved to a structural shape. And any time we do that, any time we're hacking together structural principles, making a surface structure out of a vector active structure, um, we are guaranteed almost th to have additional efficiency. The more uh, load paths we have, the more ways we can think of the behavior working, the more redundancy we have in the system, uh, and therefore the more efficient, often the more effective uh, the system is. We'll get to why shapes like this are particularly strong uh, in the next set of lectures uh, when we talk about uh, shell structures.